Well, good evening. Uh, my name is Martin Ayres and uh, a warm welcome to you, whoever you are. For, uh, thanks for joining us for this, our second evening of um, Real Lives Online with St Silas Church. I'm the senior pastor of St Silas Church and uh, we're delighted you could join us, whoever you are. Um, we are delighted that uh, Kieran Dodds is going to be with us uh, this evening. Uh, last night we got off to a great start, terrific start with our Real Lives Online, a series of three evenings. And um, we were with Emma Scrivener. That talk remains on our on our website, on YouTube channel. And um, it was uh, she was terrific. It was enormously helpful uh, hearing some uh, um, wisdom about lockdown life and how to sort of safeguard positive mental health at this testing time. And to hear her extraordinary story uh, with great honesty it was very powerful and uh, terrific to have Kieran Dodds with us. I'll introduce him in a moment, but just a reminder, I'll just share my screen and uh, just remind you um, of what we've got uh, coming up um, uh, in the next couple of days. So I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, so tomorrow night, we've got Billy McCurry with us, um, 7.45 till nine, same format as tonight. And um, we'd be delighted if you could join us, Billy, has an absolutely extraordinary story um, as he relays uh, growing up uh, during the Troubles in Northern Ireland, uh, tragedy um, and uh, joining a, a terrorist organisation, um, convicted um, of uh, a terrorist act, ended up in prison and um, now he's a Baptist minister. <laughs> so if you want to hear more about how, how that happened, uh, do join us tomorrow night. It's just great to have Billy with us again. It's, um, I assure you, it will be uh, terrific experience just hearing his story. Uh, so um, after that on Sunday, we've got Back to Church Sunday. Churches around the UK have run Back to Church Sunday for a few years. And um, this this week, we just thought, let's run it online. At the moment, um, because of the restrictions, we can't meet um, physically as a church, um, but we can um, broadcast 11 a.m. Uh, on, on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, and at 6.30, we do a Zoom meeting as well that you can sign up for through our website. And we'd love you to join us for one of those, whichever you'd prefer, watching us on YouTube or uh, slightly more being part of the meeting on Zoom in the evening. That's this Sunday. And it's called Back to Church Sunday to say, if, even if you've never been to church for years or you've only ever been for a wedding or a funeral or you've never been in your life, uh, why not come on Sunday and just come and see? Just see what it's like. It's never been easier. Uh, if you're not someone who regularly goes. For those of us who regularly are part of the church family, the current restrictions have been a very painful thing because uh, heading into last year and the pandemic um, at St Silas Church, certainly there, there was real momentum and all kinds of people would walk through the door Sunday by Sunday and are looking to make sense of life and make sense of Jesus. And that's been painful to, to have that restriction on, on us for the sake of keeping everyone safe. But if you're someone who doesn't normally come to church, it means it's never been easier to try it. Uh, so why not join us from wherever you want to be, um, your living room, your bedroom, and just uh, just join us on Sunday, Back to Church Sunday. Uh, beyond that, um, starting on Tuesday, the 9th of March, we've got four Tuesday evenings on Zoom called the Life Course. And it's a chance to consider the big questions of life and explore the Christian faith a bit further. Uh, so it's on Zoom each evening. There's uh, something to discuss. You don't have to say anything. Um, you can just remain quiet and listen, or you can ask any question you want. And we've run this course a couple of times now at St Silas. Not everyone's become a Christian uh, by any means, uh, but everyone who's come has really enjoyed it as a chance to just get under the surface and think deeply about life's big questions and the Christian faith. So that's on Tuesday the 9th of March, coming up uh, soon. Okay, so tonight I'm shortly going to introduce Kieran. Um, but just to mention that uh, we're live, 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 and um, we, I'm going to ask, I've got lots of questions for Kieran, but um, you might have some questions of your own, and we'd love to hear them and be able to ask them. Now, we're going to use this website, Slido. If you're not familiar with it, you go to slido.com, and you just type in St. Silas and next to the hashtag, or you use the link that's on the screen now, www.slido.com slash St. Silas. And uh, on there, you can you can stick a question on and um, 
we, we can ask here in the question. The other thing you can do is if you go on there and there's another person who's asked the question that you like the look of, you can vote for it. And uh, what that does is it just ranks questions according to which ones are most popular with most people uh, so that we know uh, which questions to prioritise uh, when it comes to, to asking those of Kieran. Uh, that is all I've got to introduce. Um, so without further ado, Kieran, um, can I ask you to um, appear? Um, here he is. Hello, Piers. Kieran, thanks Hi. so much for joining us. Um, Thank from you. across the central belt, tell us where you are just now. I'm at the back of my garden in Edinburgh. So across the M8, far, far away, <laughs> restricted from travel. Yeah, yeah, it's nice. Just at the bottom of the garden. Happy. G great. Uh, that's where you normally do your work, is it? Yeah, well, I'm a, obviously I, I take photos outside. But yeah, when I'm editing and um, planning and plotting and despairing, this is where I do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Kieran. We're so glad you could join us tonight. Um, I, I'm just going to dive in with some questions. I well, mean, you're a okay. photographer. Um, you know, I used to be a lawyer. I'm now a church minister. I don't even know what photographers do, apart from the obvious. Tell us what you actually do all day. Yeah, what do photographers do? Well, um, I've got some pictures to show. That's probably the best thing to do is. Um, but I'm looking for, I was actually quite enjoying just watching there, Martin. It's quite, I, was, I, I had this out-of-body experience where I thought, am I actually, is it me? Like questions for Kieran, I was going to send them in because I thought, who's this guy? <laughs> anyway, so um, yeah, the question. Please send your questions. I'm excited. I hope there's people out there, um, and I wonder what you'll ask. We're, we're going to answer such questions as why, on what day did God create gingers, and um, why? Um, I've got answers to these questions and more. But let me show you what a photographer That's extraordinary does. That you know that there are, as well as um, <laughs> right. joining us on Slido. If you want to ask a question, I just mentioned there is some. There are people joining in on the YouTube chat as well. So if you're oh, watching good. at home and you just want to um, say hi to people, uh, do get involved on the, the live chat on YouTube as well. Sorry, That's Kieran, nice. over no, to no, you. Great, Tell yeah. us how you got into it and what you do all day. That'd yeah, be great. what do I do all day? What do I do sometimes? Right, let me show you some pictures. Well, I'll start off actually with uh, this lovely quote by Muriel Rokeser, um, who's a poet, or was a poet. Um, the universe is made of stories, not of atoms. And when I saw this quote, I just thought, this is perfect. This is really what sums me up because I studied zoology, um, which is a scientific uh, study. But I also just I've, I've come to really believe that the fabric of the universe is stories, you know, the words. Um, it's this it's not just the, the basic atoms, but it's, it's this kind of bigger story. And it just yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe draw this out as we go. But I wanted to start actually with someone else's picture. This is Eric Kessels, a photographic artist in the Netherlands. And he did this work a few years ago uh, called 24 Hours um, on Flickr and Facebook and Google. And he just dumped a million pictures in various places. And I just love it. And this kind of shows part of the, the issue with photography. It's so um, ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Everyone's got a camera. You're looking at a screen which probably has a camera on it. Your phone's got one. Everyone's got cameras. And I often look at this and think, actually, what's the point? Is, is photography significant anymore? Um, there's this kind of nagging doubt that it's just all pointless and insignificant. And I think there's something of that in life, actually. For, for many years, I just felt like there's just, it's so vast, you know, what, what are we in this vastness? And that was a real question at university, um, particularly. It still hits me today, like, really? Do we value, even though we're this tiny fragment? Um, we're one, one little image among seven billion pictures, not just a million. We are one, one photograph among seven billion. And actually, in the two minutes I've been speaking there, more photos have been taken than in the entire 19th century. Um, and surely, are they all as significant? I mean, that's, that's a good question, uh, which I just, someone might ask. Um, but I, I, the, the work that I do really shows or tries to pick up on the ordinary things in life, um, the things we overlook. And actually, as we delve into the detail, we find the divine in the detail. It's not the devil who's there, it's the, it's the divine. Um, and so hopefully you'll get a sense of that um, as I show my work. I started out at age seven, looking pretty cool. Uh, I wish I could get a, a man-sized suit like that. Um, this is in Canada with an Instamatic camera. And I took my first photo I remember there, and it was this one of a raccoon. And just as I was about to take it, I, it turned towards me, and I just pressed the shutter, captured it, and I just felt this surge of joy, not only in, in admiring the creature, but it actually getting that moment. So I ran off to tell my dad. And that for me is the instinct, uh, the impulse really that has, has driven me to this day. When I take mm. 
things in the world. I see things that make me wonder and make me angry perhaps as well. Um, and I'm able to capture that and, and convey it to others. So I've not really changed since I was seven, apart from the suit. Um, and this is Malangi Mountain in Malawi, where I really had an epiphany, a career epiphany, um, flying over after two months living on the mountain, studying monkeys and trees and fish. Um, the door was off the plane and I took this photograph and just thought I'd love to do this as a job. Um, and so that's what I thought my job would be. Um, but then I came back and managed to get a job um, a newspaper. So I graduated from zoology uh, after studying monkeys and then I moved into the press. And for me, zoology taught me how to analyze the world a bit, you know, the data uh, of the, and, and kind of reading scientific papers. But working at the evening times, Glasgow's favorite, um, <laughs> for three years was a good experience. You'd, you'd get to photograph the local wildlife, but you'd also photograph everything, uh, news, early morning news shifts, um, sport events, uh, celebrities, minor and uh, slightly less minor, um, and also just the daily life of, of things happening. Mm. So it helped me communicate um, and, and learn these visual skills. Uh, I had the sort of education at uni, but that was no use in many ways when you hit the streets and you're meant to gather information with your lens and understand that you're still using the same process in your brain, but you're meant to then convey it through pictures, which is a different thing. And I was interested again in, in, in photography how, or news, how there's a kind of hierarchy of significance. Some things appear more significant every day. We found that in the last year, some people's stories seem more important than others. Uh, what, what wins? Uh, are, are some stories more important? And so I'm, I'm just as broad brushstrokes, by the way, we'll jump back to anything anyone wants to. I just want to give you a sense of the kind of the work I've been doing and how it's changed. Um, I went off to Zambia. I won a, a, an award um, with a portfolio of images as this junior photographer. And I went back to my zoological roots. And I went to a creature that is overlooked and much maligned. Um, in fact, they're blamed for this pandemic, weren't they, at first, uh, along with pangolins. But the bats are beautiful. They're intrinsically beautiful. But they're also a great utility for the ecological systems in Africa. They spread seeds of trees far and wide. So they're incredible creatures. And we we fitted a wee um, tracker to them and they went like 2,000 miles in about six months. They're just incredible creatures. Uh, and yet we, we see them as not very significant. They're ugly. We kind of malign them again. So um, I started at this point thinking about doing my own projects. So I'm showing you commissions now to give you an overview, but uh, we'll go in detail on a couple of sort of bigger uh, stories that I've done. Again, commissions for us is Smithsonian Magazine America. Um, done work for them. The Herald Magazine, we went undercover in Zimbabwe during a cholera epidemic. Um, and just some moments which, like, in my life almost, they mark out really significant moments of um, <laughs> recognizing my own mortality, in fact, at this point. Mm. Um, but it's been amazing to work alongside great writers. That was David Pratt from the, the, the Herald at the time. Um, I've did this story with Rory Smith for the New York Times of Ilkay Gundogan. When he was injured, he was on the bench. And so we got this exclusive access behind the scenes at Man City. So it's not just, and it wasn't just about soccer. It's about a human struggle against adversity. Um, so you're not just going in photographing animals or uh, sport. You're actually trying to draw the deeper um, story, not just the superficial. Uh, I heard Ilkay was East Player of the Month last month in the Premiership, which is a pretty good comeback. Well done him. Um, I think... Uh, I think I taught him some skills. Uh, this is another trip to, to Greenland with the New York Times for this week-long soccer season, which for people who aren't fans of soccer or football, um, you'll, be, you'll be pleased to hear it's only a week um, over there. And then lastly, this is what I've been doing on lockdown. Uh, obviously, as you've seen, I've traveled a bit, but um, in lockdown, you had to stay at home. Um, and so I just patrolled the streets of Edinburgh and I noticed that the, the hedges... Um, have kind of this renewed sense of purpose because we're all self-isolating at home. So they have this protective function. And so I started doing this uh, partly to keep myself sane uh, and partly uh, hoping someone might publish. And Smithsonian Magazine ran a lovely piece just in November there uh, across 12 pages with an essay by Peter Ross. So it's, it's funny how these hedges, they're very, when you read Peter's article, you'll see how significant hedges are, things we overlook, things that are ordinary. And yet when you scratch the surface or you, 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 <laughs> you push through the leaves, you suddenly see there's far more going on uh, at the bottom of your garden than you'd, you'd realize. So that's quite a lot of uh, years work there, overview. So if there's any, do you want to 
pick up an Anthony Martin and, and I can clarify or um, see something helpful. This is great, Kieran. Amazing. Great to see the pictures. Thanks for sharing these. Um, so it, you mentioned quite how many photos are being taken all the mm. time and people have access to better and better lenses and things. Um, do you, uh, does that mean you feel the pressure from that as a photographer that, you know, um, is it is it the kind of job where you worry someone else is going to um, take a better photo than you? And is it an inherently lonely job because of that? Because you kind of, you want to get to places no one else is so yeah. that your photos are, are kind of the exclusive. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. I think for, for years, and when I was at the paper, even when they were talking about people getting digital cameras, the citizen journalist, that was always the threat to professionals and freelancers. They were always worried about citizen because they'd be on the news, they'd be on the scene first. So you see a mobile phone photo first. Um, but actually there's there's a need for skilled uh, people to curate and edit what they see. And, and a professional photograph should tell a story far better than something someone, even with a good camera, can take because it's not ultimately about the, the camera and the lens. Um, it's, it needs to have a, a brain behind it, you know? And yeah. there's, there's like the overlapping circles in photography are like the technical aspects. Um, the so the technicals like the lens and the camera, then the aesthetic, so it looks pretty and it's well composed. But the thing that's very hard and the thing that that professionals should bring to it is that third element of meaning to make a meaningful picture. And not just meaningful to yourself, because you can take a meaningful picture of your child or some place you're on holiday, but it's to be able to convey something deeper um, than just this means something to me. And that that is still a skill that's in demand um, in the world, I hope. It's, it seems to be. Even if, yeah. even if all the commissions dry up during lockdown, it's there's, there's still like this. Um, you find something more unusual and just dig away at it and, and it actually produces something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so what... Um, what, what where do you categorize your work in terms of obviously mm. some of it is communicating truth and reality but then in another sense would you call it art as well I mean mm. how I guess maybe you would but how do we yeah and how do we evaluate how would you evaluate what makes a good photograph you know if, if mm -hmm. um if you were looking at something with me that someone else had taken what might make it yeah objectively that's a they've done a really good job of that or mm. or not mm -hmm. well, there's a couple of things there wasn't there so there's, yeah there was sorry well yeah no no how do i evaluate someone else's or how what was the first bit of it just does it is it art or is it, oh, is it art yeah reporting yeah, yeah. Which, so yeah. so this i started off like so photojournalism is very much reportage documentary so you're um there's less of you in it uh let's say in the in the documentation uh, and that is still really the school I've come from, the tradition in, in photography, documentary and, and reportage. Um, but I call myself on my website a non-fiction photographer because my work has actually found a home much more recently in galleries. Um, so I've had more shows and, and the, the stories I'll show you next have, um, have kind of come across in that. And I think a lot of time there is overlap. So you, you might see a picture in a gallery space that is then deemed art, but it might have been a picture taken in a war zone or um, a historic moment. So things gain significance again by the time and events and maybe the people in the picture. Mm. Um, whereas I think the difference with some art is the, the forethought of the photographer. So there's much more um, intentionality about it. So the photographer will think, right, this is the story I'm interested in. I'll do the research and I'll, I'll pursue this. Whereas sometimes when I was doing newspaper commissions, you were um, just given, go do that, take a photo of that. Um, and there was less forethought in it. And so I, I feel like the pictures, there's a, there's a visible difference in that. And then in terms of your, your friend, your uh, hypothetical, you do have friends, but I'm just saying this hypothetical friend we're saying, um, they bring this picture to you. And I suppose there'll be the instinctive reaction to it. You'll see, like, does, is this pleasing? I suppose the technical, is it well composed? Is it, is it sharp? Um, and what is it? And it might just, it might be sharp, like well composed and actually say nothing. It might just be a, sh a sharp picture of nothing. Um, whereas often it could be out of focus, it could have movement and blur, um, and yet it conveys something. So it's, it's quite a hard thing to judge. Um, 
actually how because I, I love I actually do quite like looking at people's pictures um, I, I don't like it when they th thrust a thousand images on me but one or two that's fine and I try and say to people if you do a holiday album you know um, try and like on Facebook put 12 pictures in it like that should be enough <laughs> like, there's enough pictures in the world you know have mercy you know edit um, so I, th I think it's quite an intuitive thing like what you find um, resonates with you. I think when you see a lot of art stuff in, in museums, you might not get it first time, and then it's useful to read what on earth the person was on about. And if you still don't get it, then move on. Yeah, great. Kieran, let's go on. So you, you talked there about how th these are commissions, um, but then you, your work has developed into projects as well. Mm -hmm. These would be ones of your own, would they? I mean, it'd be, you'd, yeah. well, it'd be great to hear about this. This There's a couple you're going to share with us, I think. Yeah. The first one, um, yeah, hearing a bit about, yeah, how that whole thing develops as well from inspiration, mm -hmm. what gives you the idea, how do you make that a reality, that yeah. journey, it'd be great to hear about. But yeah, great. do yeah share it with us. We'll do. Just start with this a quote by Henri Cartier-Bresson, who's like the, um, coined the term decisive moment. And I just love it. It says that the object of the photograph is man, man and his short, fragile, threatened life. Um and he and other Magnum photographers were part of this humanistic photo tradition from the 30s onwards. And, and I just love that image. It's, they're not just photographing day-to-day -day life and moments. They're, they're, they're doing something deeper. And I started a series called Hyrotopia in 2015. I got funding from the Royal Photographic Society. Um, and it's about church forests in Ethiopia. So let me, I'll tell you the story first and then... Um, you can uh, and then get into how I actually made it. But if you go later on your phone and you look up Ethiopia, um, and it'll zoom in now, hopefully. There we go. Uh, look up Ethiopia and then go in the north, you'll see Lake Tana, which is the source of the Blue Nile, and then Bahardar at the bottom. And if you go east on Lake Tana, you see these brilliant little green islands on the landscape. And every single one of them appears to have a UFO, hasn't landed from outer space. Um, and these are churches, church buildings. Um, and so I first came across this in a, an article, an African magazine had an article years ago, and I was instantly grabbed by it. This kind of the relationship between man and nature, uh, which is something that's really troubled me since I was at university. I was always seeking, like a melange, I was trying to work out how can we live sustainably? How can we live with nature, in nature? Um, and so I found this. And there's heaps of them, there's thousands of them actually across the landscape. Um, and there are places that have been protected as um, a tenet of faith. So the whole landscape was once covered in trees. And in the last hundred years, about 95% of the uh, tree cover has been lost. But around the churches, it's remained, it's almost like a, a force field um, protecting them because the people respect it. They see it actually as part of the building because no one goes in the building there. Uh, they're Orthodox Tewahedo uh, Christians. And I was really intrigued by this because when I spoke to them, they see it as a, because Eden had trees, they say. So the church must have trees around it. It's a picture of Eden. And in Africa, when people do conservation stories, they're very quick to say, oh, it's like Eden and these primitive people. Um, but actually in this case, it, it literally is. They are, they are very consciously um, like trying to evoke Eden through the biblical text. Mm. And, I wanted to show these kind of biblical themes, this idea that our life is a mist and we're passing through uh, and the trees and the forest are there much more permanent um, as a, a part of the landscape. We are just these fleeting like grass that comes and goes. Um, so I wanted to show the permanence of that. But I also loved the way that people gathered under the forest and there was singing under the same canopy as uh, ancient ancestors for, for generations they've been there. Um, and people singing alongside bird and monkey and, and insect. It's quite incredible. It feels very holistic and very Edenic in, in many ways. Um, and so I just thought it was wonderful. And it shouldn't surprise people, actually. It surprised me because I spent years trying to find a, a story like this. I've been in Tibet doing Tibetan nomads and the sort of Buddhist ideas that underpin their conservation. Um, but of course, it only struck me when I was there that the Christian symbol, the cross, is called a tree or called the tree in the New Testament. Um, and so I started thinking then about how it's actually the Bible can be summarized as a story of three trees and um, the tree at the start where it goes wrong, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree at the end, which has fruit for the healing of nations, which is the tree of life. And then in the center, you have this cross, the tree, 
where you get the wrong being turned right um, in this substitution. And so I thought, wow, here we go. We've got trees like telling us <laughs> this very complex book. You can, you can get a very broad view of it. Um, and it doesn't mean necessarily that we just protect trees then. It's a very particular purpose, the symbol. But it made me think actually how trees are icons in our world. They're pointing, they're, they're symbols and pointing us to uh, this greater story again, if we're given the, the insight into it. The story again was, I was photographically approaching it um, using the text the local people used, which is Genesis. Um, and what I love about Genesis is Genesis 1 and 2, you've got very different views of God. You've got, got Genesis 1, which is the transcendent God up there. Uh, and then you've got Genesis 2, which is God down in the garden, uh, walking in the cool of the day. And so I'd done the, the cool of the day bit, uh, walking in the forest. And so I now went up into the sky to get this um, transcendent, the, the view down um, to get more context. And it's just wonderful to see these portraits of the different congregations. You can see it's almost a collaboration between man and nature or man and God. It's got the lines of a thousand different decisions of where someone will cross home, uh, take a shortcut home where the cattle have been nibbling um, or where someone's field has um, been cut short by a path. So I just love, I just, I've got these on my wall actually in the office. There's one up there and I keep seeing new things in it every day. You know, you see something new because it's just this very complex uh, image. But of course, these are, are disappearing uh, because, as I said, the cattle come close and they nibble the edge and it thins out. And so although it's an amazing picture of how people can conserve without national parks and guns and uh, such like, it is actually something that's fading away. And so that was concerning. So on the left, you've got the sort of climax vegetation. I wanted to show that, how it can be. And then on the right hand side, what looks like the end, it's all being denuded. But actually, part of the, the issue is um, the, the high population putting pressure on, on the landscape, more farming, more cattle. But actually, the, the, the slight positive here is they've planted a new church building uh, to protect um, and well, not protect it, to, um, uh, to support the local people. And they've planted more forest around it. So that's actually new growth coming up uh, in that image. So this series... Um, was first published in Nature. Uh, it was the first time a double page picture had been used in the Nature News section. Um, and it was just wonderful to get it in there, especially because having done zoology, um, having really grappled with this issue of, you know, can science and Christianity go together? I wasn't a Christian at university um, really until the final year. And it was something I really uh, struggled with. I thought, how, how do these things go together? And actually here it's quite clear. Um, they see uh, sustainable living, they understand uh, the value of nature is a gift. You don't have to force it on them. They've, they've got this uh, themselves. National Geographic ran it a few weeks later um, online and did a nice story as well. And then in France, uh, Geo France, which is no one's heard of in the UK, but Geo is a nice magazine. Um, and then also had an exhibition in uh, near LA and we did a symposium with theologians, with scientists, and just discussing these uh, ideas. You know, how, how can we uh, protect the, the, the environment using these, because it's ideas that have shaped this landscape. How can we engage people with these ideas in the landscape? And just as lockdown hit, this exhibition in downtown in Hollywood, in LA itself, um, it was a group show about trees, uh, but the spiritual uh, view of trees and different art. Um, and it was just, it was, it was nice to get it in there. But again, it's, it's this um, question of how do we, how do you engage uh, these, communities uh, they seem to be left out because there's this sort of this mistrust between science on one hand and and religious communities on the other so i'm still working away at this i'm, I'm trying to work on a book just now uh, again self-publishing this year for cop the cop summit uh, i believe your city's hosting a few people that's right we're uh, hosting that yeah gearing up for that yeah so we could print one of these in your, the side of your church if you want but yeah it's, i think i'll do a book and try and again it's just trying to um, engage the people with uh, these views Hi. So that's that's Hyrotopia. The name Hyrotopia, I should say, is um, there's a, a Russian academic called Alexei Lidov, and he studied um, a thing called Hyrotopy. He, he coined the term himself. Um, but it's basically how when you go into a Byzantine church, a Russian Orthodox church, you'll see um, like the stained glass and the icon and the clothes. And it's they give a sense of the sacred. So Hyrotopia is a study of this sacred spaces. Uh, and so having spoken to Alexei, 
um, he agreed that the, the forests are part of that sacred space. So it's again, it's a different <clears throat> sort of tradition from yourselves, but it's uh, using, yeah, it's, 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 there's very clear connections actually as well. I could say more about, but I'll, I'll stop. Hmm. Great. So um, I've got lots of questions. Oh, just to mention, just to remind people who maybe joined late that you can ask questions of Kieran. So you go to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com, and you type in St. Silas, S-T-S-I-L-A-S, or you just go to slido.com slash St. Silas, and you can submit a question, you can vote for a question that you like there, and I can ask Kieran those questions. Um, the link is in the, uh, the, the live chat as well on YouTube. Kieran, you, um, you mentioned, you know, that there was a time you're wrestling with this, mm. and I guess you could have gone one of two ways yourself at uni. Um, you're doing your zoology, you're wrestling with, on one level, are we just completely insignificant? There mm. are billions of us. It's a huge cosmos. It's a big world. And um, I guess wrestling with questions of how do we live sustainably in the world, as you mentioned, mm. And you came through with a Christian worldview. Mm. Um, can you say any more about that? What, 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 for you personally, what was it that kind of, um, yeah, moved you into seeing things that way when you mm. maybe could have gone the other way and, and thought, well, no, I, I don't think there is a God of all this. Yeah. Oh, so much to that. I think, um, so grow it before I went to university, um, obviously, I was obsessed. I loved nature, um, and especially the Edinburgh programs as well. And it was it was just trying to reconcile if the if the universe is just matter and it's driven by a blind, purposeless um, process. Why bother conserving? Why are we bothering to do this? Actually, and it was in my third year. I did a bioethics course, and I thought, why didn't we do a, like a <laughs> philosophy of science course in the first year? Because actually, you need to do that. You need to question why. Why do we even trust? Our, our rationality is this even real um and it was that it was that really in my mind i was just like why why do we act like these things are beautiful and intrinsically worthy and worth conserving and at the same time talk about actually the the main per point of life is to propagate your genes and survive um and that i still i still find that funny when i've watched um programs on tv and that it's just like you're seeing this incredible beauty and you're overwhelmed with it in your heart. And yet we're, we're, we're meant to be told we're part of a system which is basically um, entropy is increasing and the, the, the earth will be destroyed anyway. And um, that's a secular kind of view of uh, the apocalypse. It's just gonna be when the sun expands and destroys us. But, I, so I was struggling with that at university and then, but the trouble was, I just didn't see Christianity or any religious worldview particularly, I looked at many um, as coherent enough to work with that um, and a couple of things happened so my brother came back from oxford he studied medicine there and, and he came back as a christian and he seemed uh, we thought he was in a cult or something and he was just being <laughs> annoying but he, he seemed to beat me up less and he was kind to me so that was good um but he forced me to look at to consider the gospels and to, to think actually did jesus rise physically from the dead and i quick quite quickly thought that's the key thing that's the crux you know crux means pertaining to the cross but that is the key central thing. If you can take that down, then, then it all falls. And I tried and failed, but that wasn't enough because I, I come to conclusion it was true. You know, uh, it, was, it was news, but I didn't believe it was good. Um, and I think going to Malangi up in the mountains, studying the monkeys and um, being far from home and being very sort of uh, homesick and looking for these kind of, just feeling very empty inside actually. I felt like all the joy and just went into this sort of dark pit. Um, it just disappeared you know you had to keep topping up and in malawi i just saw the local christians who were just full of joy you know you get a bus and they'd be like ah what church do you go to and you'd be like i always said baptist for some reason and um, i was like oh baptist and they're like ah wonderful um and i just thought these sh they showed me it was good you know it's, it's life-giving in scotland we're kind of led to believe in particular it's, it's like a um the doer presbyterian you know it's it's, it's mm. calvinism is destructive and there is aspects of that, of course, but um, I've come to read some Calvin and actually Calvin's amazing. He loves the arts, he loves nature. He's, he's very life affirming. And actually modern environmentalism comes from Calvinistic worldviews. Um, but that's for another story um, some other time. So 
yeah so it was that going to malawi and just seeing seeing that and so i came back very reluctant and sort of one night just prayed you know if this is real like, um help uh and over the months i kind of started to um go to church and and read for myself more more and more and it's just been over the years it's kind of grown and it's something which as a photographer you're kind of dealing with all of life you know at the evening times you'd see some of the worst uh aspects of life uh, addiction and and uh, crime and things like that so y- you had to take your faith to that and think how does this fit uh, but yet in all the years I've never come across anything where I don't um, see how it, it fits together I mean there are I've not answered all questions of course but there seems to be this kind of we're all seeking for this meaning uh, beauty is real and uh, nature is wonderful these these things are not a, uh, just an illusion I've probably said too much there, but um, yeah, something like that. Great. Well, thanks, Kieran. If anyone wants to ask more about it, get a question on slido.com. Um, Kieran, when you, I mean, you've talked there about the the, uh, the climate conference in Glasgow. Mm. Um, so I guess your photography of this, I mean, this Herotopia project, mm. on one level, it it communicates something that in itself is is extraordinary and beautiful that you wanted to share Mm -hmm. and yet is there a kind of edge to a moralizing edge to photography like this in that are you hoping that people that you evoke a response in people of wanting to conserve or or is it more yeah how do you see that yeah I i suppose um yeah, it's, it's, people talk about activism now. Photographers would be more happy with the term activism than uh, moralizing. But I suppose it's the same thing in many ways, isn't it? You're trying, to, <laughs> you're trying to get some response. But with the work, I did do it with the integrity of just, I want to show this story. I, was, I feel that from the journalistic training, you, you want to show what is there. You don't have to add any sort of bells and whistles. It's, it's, the world is remarkable. Just show it as it is. Um, and so I've always been doing that, but I do feel like, so in producing a book, I want to produce something that's, that is integri- that it has integrity with the work and what's happening. But also with that, I'm also, I feel the responsibility of having been given special access to these very private communities mm-hmm. uh, and with the local scientists as well. I want to champion them and, and get the word out because there's a thing called the Great Green Wall. And if you've watched the new uh, BBC Perfect Planet, David Amber thing, which again has got an amazing sort of picture of a perfect planet and then things went wrong. Human beings made it go wrong. I mean, it's like, I've heard this before. Hold on. Where's this from? Um, but in that, in the last episode in particular, it's got this piece when it all seems so bleak, he then goes to the Great Green Wall, which stretches under the Sahara across um, the width of Africa. And at the right hand side of the east side, you've got Ethiopia and actually the church forests cover an area the size of England and Wales, these little islands. Huh. And they're not integrated in this grand scheme, which the UN are kind of supporting. And I just want to like join the dots, literally, between these big mega projects and the local community, but also between these patches of forests. If you connect them up, you've got this incredible green network that is already protected on the ground. Um, the people are, they're motivated to do it. They just want to build a little wall around it to protect it, conservation wall. And so I do want, I just want to join the dots and then, step back you know the work has integrity in itself but i do feel there's responsibility um to to tell that story um to people mm. who can actually change it and it's an ethiopian story and even ethiopians don't know about it so i kind of want to mm. get it into the country as well um which I've, I've done a bit um through through various things so the, ni- the nice thing it won a sony world photo award for the landscape series um it came third and as part of that, the award ceremony, I went down and then I met the ambassador, the Ethiopian ambassador for a, a cup of coffee. And it was just so good because I just thought this is this is what it's about. You know, you want to get it into their hands. It's their, it's their national treasure, um, but it's also a global um, example to us all and to, to Christians in the West as well. Like, this is an intrinsic um, part of, of the faith, like seeing the world as a gift and to protect it. Mm. Great. How extraordinary that they've seen. I mean, it's such a compelling uh, way to present the Christian faith in the West at the moment, the current environment, to say um, that, as you said, the story of there was a perfect planet and we were making a mess of it Mm. coheres with 
the Bible's worldview, but also yeah. the, it, the Bible holds out a promise that it will be restored and that there is a tree at the end, the tree of mm. life, and there is a garden yeah. um, that we're heading for, that there is a God of all this who'll put things right. Um, That's yeah, funny because the solution, complex. the solution on Perfect Planet seems to be trees. It's all about trees. Right. It's, it's right. It's like it's about trees, the tree for the healings of nation, you know? It's mm. it's it's kind of it's there. It's almost there, you know. Um, as far as you could go with a natural history program. There's so much more I'd want to ask about that project. <laughs> it looks absolutely fascinating, but I think yeah. we should move on. Yes. Um, so we give time something... for uh, other people to chip in with questions as well. So, um, yeah, go on. I think the first time I heard you speak here, and it was on BBC Breakfast. Okay. <laughs> um, about this project. So, um, yeah, let's hear more about it. Yeah, I'm slightly more awake. That was a, a rude awakening that day. Um, so 2013, before the Scottish independence referendum, I'd started thinking about some pro, uh, some stories to, to do. And um, one was a landscape series shot on analog uh, camera. One was 16-year-olds who could vote, interviews with them. Um, what was the other one? one? A film on unicorns, because that's a national beast. It's a myth. Uh, I like that. And then also I interviewed people called William Wallace, called what would William Wallace do and just asked them what they'd vote um so I did that but the one that really caught on and lasted was this series on the national cliche of ginger hair because I thought everyone thinks we're ginger and pale and although I am exactly that and actually it's only like 13 percent maximum so very few people in Scotland are um so as I started researching this in 2013 I found this dubious map on the internet which is a great way to start a series um and I loved it and the one thing I loved particularly was this hot spot in Russia you know, the red Russians. Um, so I, I kind of stored that in the back of my head and then carried on. Um, and then it coincided with a trip to the National Gallery on the Mount. Um, and I was up in the early Renaissance room and I noticed that every single painting, I've been tipped off actually by a theologian about red hair and paintings, but every single painting in that early Renaissance room had a ginger person in it. And usually it was uh, Jesus or Mary, actually. So the central character um, it was Ginger, here's Mary in Botticelli's. We've um, actually, sorry, Kieran, because yeah. you're in full floor, this is great, but one of the questions that someone has already pitched quite early, Doug, someone got in early doors tonight saying, why is Jesus, you know, painted as, as, as having ginger hair? Around that that's picture? a great question. That's a great question. Well, we'll get to that. <laughs> okay, right, go we'll on. We'll get to it now, I suppose. Yeah. We go, yeah, go for it. So, I mean, the funny thing is, there's, there's not much written about it. I asked a few art historians and read around and there's a lot talked about jesus haircut and there's all kinds of de there's, there's all about his haircut but not his hair color um and there's all kinds of things about like the, the flowers at the bottom left the species you know or a snail representing death and decay and there's nothing about the central character's hair color and you think this is you've, you've overlooked something you know so I, I don't think it's botticelli went in and it was like a fire sale on pigment you know oh here's some here's some cheap uh, orange pigment for you mate but I think it's it's a couple of things. So visually, it draws the eye, doesn't it? You're, you're drawn to the character, and they're at the centre. But also, um, it's beautiful, and they were obsessed with that, this golden colour. The blue and the gold and, uh, are very um, sort of quintessential uh, pictures from that time. And so the gold draws the eye. It is beautiful. It's a picture of the divine. And notice as well, her halo there, it's the same colour. So it's almost like a hairy halo, if I could say that. Um, so it's, it's kind of this touch of the divine it's to it's an artistic shorthand for this is you know something that something amazing is going on here and I've, i tried this i went to the hermitage in st petersburg and i was showing my pictures i was doing a talk in the, the theater in the hermitage and i thought before i did the talk i should check this theory out you know and so i walked out the theater went right into this room and then through two rooms to the da vinci's um but every single painting in this room and the next room we're ginger, every single one. And I looked up on the map and it said early Renaissance. So I thought that clearly there's something going on here. You know, they're using it. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. It's a divine thing. Um, but I also think with Christ, it's, it's a symbolism of like a crown. You know, instead of using a physical crown on his head, mm. Christ the King, mm. let's use this golden, <laughs> like here, you know, it, it has the same job uh, in our, our minds. It kind of radiates. Um, so I think that's probably why. But again, no one's really researched it. It's a PhD out there for someone. Um, I'm not going to pay, but some, someone will do it. So that's probably why. Um, and that was kind of the aesthetic I took. I didn't want to um, just try and copy pictures, but I did want to reference that sense of the beauty and the divinity and, and the this, this sort of um, that spark in each of us that we're made of this, um, this matter. 
Um, and that's the dignity that we all share, even if it's marred. Um, but in ginger people, you can really see it. And you can see as well um, in different nations. This is a guy from Israel, um, Gilad. And as I did the project more and more, started in Scotland. I went to London and met him there. And then I met other people. I went to Russia to the hotspot um, in the city of Perm, which is perfect. Um, and, uh, and then I showed those photos side by side in Inverness. So I had a, a, it was a commission by a photo festival in Inverness. <clears throat> And I wanted to compare the, the British and the Russian side by side in an exhibition because everything Russian is seen as um, dubious and dodgy and, and, and sort of like every headline was Russians hacking, poisoning, um, spying, all that stuff. And so I thought, actually, what do real Russians do? You know, so I want to compare them and contrast um, and put them side by side and show that we're all made of the same substance. And actually, with the ginger hair, you can do that. You can link people across these cultures. And this wee lad, um, who's in Inverness, he's Scottish, but his dad is from the Middle East and his mum's from Eastern Europe. And so in him, you've got this picture of human beings, this incredible um, traveling species. And you've got his hair, which is just uh, glowing there, radiating, you know. And It's magnificent, um, isn't it? That's a good But that's cut. so interesting that it wasn't, yeah, that his parents were not from, yeah, yeah they're not, yeah. And um, I mean, we had, we've got a ginger daughter who... Um, when we moved to um we moved up to glasgow five years ago and in the first summer of being here you know we're walking down the street and she's running ahead of us as a toddler with ginger hair everywhere and we heard some american tourists you know bring real attention to this authentic yeah. scottish child because yeah. that was in their heads all the yeah, wow yeah, yeah. there's a scottish child yeah. but yeah. actually she wasn't scottish yeah. so yeah just, yeah that's the go, funny go thing yeah and then the paintings in the renaissance these are southern european artists they're documenting like, well, they're, they're painting Middle Eastern characters. You know, it's a universal trait. It's, it's, it, like in Southern Europe, you didn't get many of them, but it was known there. Um, yeah. And same below the border. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a Scottish thing. Yeah, this, this girl actually, uh, Sveta Ni, her father's side of the family were from China, Ni. Um, and yeah. if you look at Perm on the map, you can see how that fits. And so I just, the more and more I did this, the more I just got intrigued by it. And then it took me to Jamaica, lastly, um, to... Uh, Treasure Beach, which is a place of um, successive waves of people coming in and out, uh, traveling through, and of, of course, slavery as well, just along the, in Black River. So you had like African slaves, you had Scottish indentured laborers working side by side as well. Um, but you you have this kind of incredible mix over the years and, and these amazing people. And I, I kind of wanted to focus on that, about how human beings is just, um, yeah, I suppose a spark of um, a hint of divine. You know, it's been bestowed upon us and it's, it's a kind of a proof in many ways of the wonder of creation. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's bizarre, though. It feels like a story I'm dragged along in the wake of uh, because it just seems to get good attention. I'm working on something else just now to take it uh, somewhere further. But um, yeah, it's a BBC break because that was funny. Um, and I did it because I did the book. And I'm not just doing a, a blatant plug. I want to show you something in the book here. Um, so in the book, it's just it's a it's a photo book, so it's just mainly photographs, brief intro. But in it, I just put the person's name, their country, and the year of birth. Mm. And so I'm just doing a slight referencing there of a family tree, you know, because we're all part of this family. And I want people to compare and contrast and look and try and find these connections between us, because especially at a time of pandemic where we're um, it's very gloomy, it's quite nice to have this brightness and this beauty, but also to see people as people. Uh, not as a bag of a disease, uh, a vector of uh, illness. And so that's partly why I did it then and maybe why people liked it. Um, so, yeah, the paperback's still available, um, but the, the hardback sold out, I'm afraid. Um, I'll go back to this picture and then you can ask, ask anything else. Great. Um, we've, we've, got, we've got some questions through. Um, I thought I might pitch one of those at you, having yeah. heard about a couple of the projects, which is just what, what is, do you have a favourite photo that you've ever taken? Oh. And if you do, why is it your favourite? Mm, You're allowed to, if you want to. <laughs> ah, it's hard, isn't it? It's hard. Um, I mean, the ones that are on my walls. So I'll take a favourite from each of these series. So that one, obviously, the Mackays. So they're a family up in Perth. And just, for me, they've... Uh, the response that that 
photos brought has been wonderful and glorious. And it was also a, a picture that required perseverance. So sometimes you take a picture that takes a lot of effort and it's not a very good picture. Whereas that took a lot of effort, um, trying to wrestle everyone into the right place and get everyone just like, it took a while to get, they got bored of me and then the, the picture came. Um, so I love that picture, the Mackays. Um, from, and Hyrotopia just is, is my favorite series. I think the one on the left here is one of my favorites. It's, it was, that was a church actually. So remember that one on the left. It is the church you see here. No, no, not there. Or there. Come on, come on. It's these animations blowing my effects budget. So this picture here is that, that, that's the church from the ground. And when I went there in 2016, I just thought I need to get up in the air. And it took another two and a bit years. There were states of emergency. We had twins in the meantime. And there's just so many things stopped me from getting there. Uh, and so when I eventually got back and got that picture on the left and you've got Sunday service going on, um, I just love it. I just, um, it just felt like a dream come true in many ways because you, you work, you worked and not given up. And it was one of these beautiful Sunday mornings. You had to trek in a couple of miles um, over this beautiful landscape, totally peaceful. And then, yeah, I just, that, that for me was just a experiential wonder. Because that's it. That's why I do photography. I do. I do it to be there in the moment and to be able to exp like um, capture things happening, but also be there uh, while they're happening. Yeah. Um, you so that there's another question, I guess, slightly related to that. You've, you talked about capturing, seeing the divine in the detail, and that we have talked about some images of incredible beauty and beauty in ordinariness as well. But you also have captured some some awful things, um, mm. you know, the cholera epidemic and yep. uh, tragedy. So how did you how did you reconcile that with mm. with 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 being a Christian and this idea of seeing the divine in the detail when actually yeah. something so hard? Well, in this this is this picture really had a profound effect to me actually. Um, at that time, we so we we got up to. Harare. We've been in Bulawayo mainly, but we flew to Harare under this huge thunderstorm brewing. So it really felt like pathetic fallacy. You know, the, the weather's reflecting the mood. And there was three funerals going on simultaneously in the background. You can see three funerals just up there. Um, so we're over there and we'd, we'd actually been invited over. It's amazing. The local people had said, come over, you know, please show this uh, to the wider world. And, and I suppose the divine there is the grace of these. There was Christians, you know, and they were there to mourn. But there was such an openness and there was there was such a profound um, moment um, in that passing in the tragedy. There was there was there was a real spirit of um, solidarity there. Um, and when I came around again afterwards, I spoke to this is Elijah, who was in the he's digging graves barefoot. And he said, come down, you know, come into the, come and help me. Um, and again, I, I didn't know what to do in that that moment. But for me, it was a real um, challenge, actually. I think it was a. Um, a word to it was a real moment of like i'm actually the same as this guy we're both the same um and he's in the a hole digging a ditch and i'm out here documenting it and it's, it's kind of stuck with me that moment and um, that sense of mortality that our lives are short and we will eventually be uh, put underground or um burnt so yeah so i think even in these tragic moments there's there's often a, just a, a spark of um grace or um or just sorrow just from the bible doesn't shirk from that you know jesus's mm -hmm. death under a gloomy sky suffering you know god himself um doesn't hide from the fact there's suffering he suffers he walks with us um he doesn't offer light at the end of the tunnel he offers light in the tunnel you know and he walks through that mm -hmm. so yeah so even moments like this although they do shake you personally you think and it, you, you have to <laughs> Sort of go over it in your head and try and work a way through. It's it's not, it's not like a surprise to the Bible. It's not like God looks down and goes, "Oh, what's happened here?" You know, it's like it's through the whole thing. You know, Genesis, the book of Genesis, and he died, and he died, and he died. Like constantly, <clears throat> that is the outrage in the biblical story. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that helps. Great. So um, a couple of questions, maybe on a similar theme. Maybe people who are. Christians asking about how um, maybe maybe artistic creative Christians just talking about um, how do you turn creativity into a, a ministry is there a way in which um, 
yeah, you see what you're doing as something that's, you know, a ministry and something that you're doing for the God you follow. And, and, and another question about can we know more of God as creator through our creativity? So we've talked about, you know, we've shared about the Bible and you know, all that you kind of draw from there. Um, but do you find that you can know more of God through your creativity? Any thoughts on those two questions? The first question was, do I how do we turn our creativity into, into a ministry? ministry? As a way of yeah. serving God, I guess that yeah, means. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, I think early on when I started doing photography, I think I was so broken by working at the Evening Times. Um, I used to pray a lot and um, at church as well, just found great comfort in the teaching um, because we are placed we're replaced to serve um and just doing our job actually is service you know doing what you're meant to do um and delighting in, in god through that is is mm. kind of what we're meant to do you know that is um serving and to, to use it for the benefit of others i think journalism is a great service to god actually and um, you might not think that people hate the press for some reason um but there's amazing uh, journalists do incredible work and photographers and mm. um if they are doing that for the glory of god that's a, a worthy service you know even if they're not it's, it's a sort of common grace to the rest of us you know that people are holding power to account i think as christians that was the question um the ministry is in your heart you know it's it's serving god through your work are you are you helping people and you know it you know it when you try and cut corners and you think well i'll just do this for the money and then go home um, it produces terrible work and you feel dreadful so <laughs> so it's better just to, to to serve through that what was the second question again um the second question was about um whether you feel that you get to know god better through mm. your creative work yeah i think i think what that is um obviously the, the bible helps us know like what god is like but you do, you experience it all the time, like him coming through and like, so I, like other photographers as well, I know they pray because <laughs> they've said so much um, because you're just going into something totally unknown and you're trying to make a picture from it. So you're just praying like one in some situations you'll be safe. You don't know what you're going to get. So you're just praying constantly. And there's been so many times when you've been like, you just see a hand at work, you know, and um, you're, you're marvelously helped as people might say. And I've, I've found that countless times constantly. Um, and so you really just feel like that's good. But you have to, you have to start a place where you know that uh, the Bible loves creativity. God is a creator. He's a creative creator. And I think if you start from that perspective, you, you see your work is of worth. And then when you do that, you realize actually all the good things that come th um, through your work or even the obstacles, you know, are gifts um, and I think that's 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 been true in my experience. Mm. And it means when good things happen, you can actually enjoy them because you think this is a gift. You know, let's enjoy this and share it with others. Kieran, just a couple more questions. I think two more. So <laughs> first was, um, do you identify with your photos in the way that um, a singer might say, "Well, actually, my song was about a personal experience I went through," mm. or an author might write themselves into their book and and yeah. say well actually i'm writing about something that that there was a, an experience for me yeah is that something that that goes on for you with your photos that's a good question um i think yes i think part so in contemporary art there's often a lot more of the artist written into the the piece and i think because i'm trained journalistically my instinct is to just like to show what's in front of the camera and of course I'm thinking about it and I'm bringing my perspective, but um, I think where you see me is in the stories I choose. And maybe that came out tonight. I mean, gingers, you can kind of see me written in that, can you? Um, <laughs> Cause it is written in my genes. Whereas, and the church forest again, hopefully explained that well, that again is a very personal work. Um, although I'm not putting myself into it, you know, a, a pale ginger guy might stick out a bit in, in these pictures. But I'm, it's something which I wrestle with. It's a question I love. Uh, you know, how can how can man live with nature or in nature, um, and how also does Christianity apply to this? Um, 
and again, it's, uh, it's a, yeah. So I, I feel like that's why I found such depth in it. It's, it resonates with me. So maybe more what I choose rather than um, how, um, how I put myself into it. I know many, and it's, it's great. I love work where photographers and artists put themselves into it more, but just the way I'm um, coming at it is much more what I choose um, and maybe how, how we do it. Yeah. And yeah, maybe that's great. useful. Great. Um, yeah. I just had a question about, it, it's not so much about the photographs, but the experience you described Have you, you mm. met these, you met these, quite different uh, Christians in Ethiopia with mm -hmm. quite a different tradition. They don't go in the building. They have a different way of practicing their faith. And then you talked about the kind of joy you saw in Malawi. Mm -hmm. And then you contrasted that a little bit with maybe the public perception in Scotland yeah. of, of a very doer kind of, um, someone said to me about the Scottish perception of Christianity that there's a God out there who, who doesn't mind what you do as long as you don't enjoy yourself yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. this kind of, it's so kind of thing, yeah. I don't know how we got there, but how mm. do you, how do we get out of that? <laughs> do, any thoughts <laughs> on that? How do we, how oh. do we communicate something different um, to people about, you know, which, which conveys some of the, what you experienced in Africa of that yeah. joy, joy and life giving nature. Yeah. Of faith. Yeah. And I think there's something in personality in Scots that we're naturally quite doer. Um, and we can blame we can we can blame Christianity for that, but I think it's just the weather, to be honest. Um, and the thing, yeah, I I I I don't know. I think people have got to um, come and experience what church has been like. Like for me, as a young Christian coming to a big church in Glasgow, and suddenly every Sunday, so I was in the newspaper. And I was just finding it so hard, you know. And then I come to church on Sunday and find that literally every nation on earth seemed to be there. People from every background, politically, um, culturally, you know, and and every every background you can imagine. I thought, here's a place where everyone's gathered together. It's amazing. Like, this is something. It's almost like bring people into that and see. I mean, obviously, you can't just now because we're not allowed to. Um, but that, that was the thing that has always struck with me as the kind of the witness of the church. And going to Malawi, meeting these people, I mean, they just, yeah, they had this sort of, um, yeah, it's just amazing. It's this global, global thing. Um, but I think, I don't know how we, we change our personalities in that respect, but I think, I think it shows, maybe, the, the people I met who just have, they've got hope. It's not a pointless, empty existence. You know, beauty is real. Meaning is real. This is uh, what you're doing. You know, your work has dignity. You have dignity. Um, these are all Christian things. And I think, reading around things like um i mean dominion has been quite popular just showing the christian roots of everything like the good things like education uh human rights uh even conservation that's what i was saying like calvinism it's a congregationalists I, i've not got time but um in america um and the uk this the congregationalist this calvinist view of nature which actually gave rise to the modern environmental movement there's a great book in it um but that's that's been sort of disconnected. So there's there's this legacy there, and I think people are discovering it now. When actually postmodernism is kind of um, rootless, and we're sort of floating off down a river. So yeah, I, th I think just if if Christians just um, keep reading and chatting about it, be nice. That's You're a terrible way brilliant. to end. Be nice is a terrible way to end. Do you want to <laughs> end any differently? Um, I was going to I was going to show the Eric Kessel's picture on. again. Yeah, you give us that. Yeah, because I, I start with someone else's picture and end with it. Um, so, yeah, I just I was thinking about pictures and how I thought were insignificant. But again, I was thinking about how, think of a photograph of, that you've got at home of a loved one. And the value of that little slice of time, this little picture in the 7 billion has, is infinite value in the one who beholds it. And I, I think that's, um, the Bible story would say that, you know, we are one of those images and he holds us in his hand with great care. There is significance, even in this, this microscopic little speck that we are in this universe, mm. um, we we have that um, we have that image born uh, in his hands. Kieran, thanks so much. If you um, if you could stop share, I'll just <laughs> share something here. All righty, that That's is brilliant. Really so nice. helpful. Thanks for um, having me. I feel thanks like for the we questions. Could, we could go on and on, but we've committed to a nine o'clock finish, so we're just going to uh, move on now to. Um, uh, having heard uh, Kieran there. Now, last night we, we started this. We're just over the three evenings, going to just look for a few minutes. 
at, um, to round off each evening with a reflection on something that Jesus said that's recorded for us by one of his followers, John. Um, let me just read it for us. Um, hopefully you can see it on the screen. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the claim, there's a claim and a call. And the claim is, I am the light of the world. Um, now, what does that mean? Um, well, let's just think about what we mean by light when we talk about light. Um, light is life. Um, he even says in the next bit that, you know, uh, if you follow him, you have the light of life. There's this connection between light and life. And we know more about that now in that if the sun was suddenly to to stop shining, uh, we'd have about eight and a half minutes, I think, uh, with the speed of light. Uh, but it wouldn't take long for us to be finished uh, as, as everything cooled and we were plunged into darkness. We'd be sunk. Um, so light is life. Along with that, light is truth. I don't know whether you've ever had the experience of um, waking up in the night in an unusual place, whether it's a hotel room or a tent, and you, you clatter around because you don't know where things are. And the way to find the truth is to turn on the light. And um, light brings us truth. Um, light brings joy. Uh, if you think about how we feel as the days get longer in, um, in springtime, there is a, just a there's just a lifting, isn't there, of our mood because um, light brings joy and light is also a picture of beauty. You know, every other colour comes from light, doesn't it? Uh, without light, we wouldn't have colour and we wouldn't have uh, beauty. And we've been thinking a bit tonight about photography as capturing beauty. And um, it's a fascinating thing to ponder, isn't it, with different worldviews. If there's no God, what do we even mean by that? What do we mean by the idea that something is beautiful when we see a sunset? I've got a friend who um, who's not a, not a Christian, doesn't believe in God, and he once um, shared with me his rage. He was looking at a sunset uh, with his fiance, I think, and um, he was sitting on a veranda with a drink. And um, what ruined it for him was he heard a Christian near him say, um, isn't God amazing that he created that? And my friend was livid. He said, oh, that's really sport, my view, that, talking about God. And I just thought, what, what actually really spoils a beautiful view? Is it that worldview, that there is a God who made this and made us to appreciate this? Isn't it more spoiling the view to believe that actually the only reason why we, believe, we are attracted to that picture, rather than something we find grotesque, is purely that we're complex survival machines. And at some stage, our ancestors whether primitive creatures or whatever they were, a shared ancestry, uh, had a survival advantage by finding that view attractive. Isn't that a pretty depressing way to enjoy a sunset or even enjoy it with uh, the person you love? It, it, these are just chemical reactions and survival instincts. Well, light is a picture of beauty. And, and as we heard from Kieran, he sees something about beauty that is objective. And I think most of us do deep down. I think we get that. So when Jesus says to the people, I am the light of the world, what he's saying to them at the time, they had a festival going on, a religious festival, where there was a, a recognition that God gives light, God's the giver of light, and it was bittersweet for them because they believed that that light had, had been withdrawn from them. And Jesus gets up and says, I am the light of the world, which means it's, an, it's as provocative and extraordinary acclaim then as it is for us today, for different reasons, I guess. But for you today to hear Jesus say to you, I am the light of the world. Uh, what he's saying is, if we want life, we go to him. Uh, life that we were made for, uh, we're lacking it without him. Life in all its fullness, as he calls it. Um, I, um, I was struck by hearing both a journalist and a politician. They don't normally agree, do they, journalists and politicians? And I heard a journalist uh, say very recently the same thing as a politician which was with the current, with the pandemic and the lockdown, um, lots of us feel this isn't really living, is it? What we're having to endure um, for lots of us, so much has been taken away. It doesn't really feel like living. Well, what if, just what if we'd been in a kind of diminished life our whole lives? And because it's all we've ever known, we hadn't realized. Jesus says we were made by a good, generous, giving God 
and that true life comes from relating to that God well and going through life knowing him with us in the joys, in the sorrows and uh, having hope of a future with him and that that is life in its fullness. Jesus is the light of life. We find that life through him. He's the light of truth in that uh, without him, he's saying we're in the dark. Uh, the, we're, we're playing guessing games, speculation about ultimate reality. When we come to him, we find the truth. He's the light that brings joy to life. And he's the light of beauty. Um, that actually all these things that we find beautiful around us in human nature, uh, in the world, um, in the natural world, are, um, are just glimpses of a creative creator, as Kieran described him, uh, where true beauty is found in beholding him. And uh, Jesus is the light of pure goodness as well. Uh, that is that, uh, and this is where things get really provocative for us. Um, when, when people rejected Jesus at the time, um, it, Jesus said it wasn't for lack of evidence. He'd done miracles in front of them to demonstrate that he was from God. But he said it was because they, they wanted to stay in the darkness, away from the purity and goodness of God found in him. So very provocative, but Jesus is the light of goodness as well as the light of life. So it's a massive claim Jesus makes. I am the light of the world. It's a wonderful claim. It vindicates our searching, our longings for life, for beauty, for truth. Uh, and then he makes this offer, this call. Whoever follows me, whoever we are, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness but will have the light of life. So a bit like a, a good photograph that evokes a response, Jesus doesn't just put a claim out there for us to um, move on from. He calls us to live our lives following him, to turn back to God through him and live a life learning from him and his words. And that's what we're trying to do in our church family at St. Silas. We don't believe we're any better than anybody else. We're not looking down on anyone else. In fact, a lot of the time, we're freely admitting we're not very good at this. But we're a group of people who believe that Jesus is the light of the world. There's never been anyone like him. We're amazed by him. He's magnificent. And we believe that he has offered us and granted us freely life, truth, joy, beauty and goodness. So that comparing my experience before I was a Christian with now as a Christian, it's like before the world was in black and white. And now I see it in colour. So what's your response to Jesus' words? What do you think? I hope you join us this Sunday at 11 a.m. or 6.30 for our guest, our Back to Church Sundays. Um, you could come on the life course if you've got questions uh, to engage with uh, starting a week on Tuesday. Uh, but we would love you to keep thinking about the big questions of life and the claims of Jesus in Scotland, what they mean for us in Scotland tonight and today. So thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks once again to Kieran. Absolutely terrific to hear him. And we'll see you with Billy McCurry tomorrow night, if you can join us, same time, uh, same place. That's us. Uh, thanks again.